So we've got Ben Miller, who's going to be showing us PowerShell for the SQL DBA. Uh, the, day, the, the agenda is going to be pretty short as far as slide goes, but there's lots of content that will fill our hour. And I could probably go on for days, but we won't do that here. Now, we're going to first talk about the environment. The environment is where I find in all my classes and all my, my sessions that I teach uh, is seems to be the hardest. Um, I'm not, I, I've been doing it so long that I don't really think about it anymore. Um, but there's some simple things that um, setting up the environment seems to catch people. So um, a lot of the modules and things have made it simpler. So we're going to talk about how to get started at least to get things going. And then we're going to talk about some PowerShell basics. Um, a lot of the DBAs uh, are, are not really interested, it seems, to code. So we're going to show you some of the basics that will help you to be able to read scripts enough to know what they do and also to use them and to maybe even create your own little scripts. But most of this session will be talking about modules and how we get things done. Um, the, the PowerShell basic session is a little, I mean, part is a little longer uh, than some just because um, it is meant, this one was meant to give people an idea of how you get started with PowerShell, what it is and how you use it. Um, and some from a best practices perspective of things that happen and you want to know why they happen so that you don't uh, have problems in your environment or troubleshoot for two hours to find out it was because of a thing that it was pretty simple. So then we're going to talk about modules and getting things done with those modules. So with that, we'll just cut right into demo. See, that was pretty good slides, huh? All of these slides were created from design ideas, this little thing in, Power, in PowerPoint that has a little design ideas in it and it formats and has all these other different uh, slides that you can put your text in. So I just put a dumb, silly thing on the slide and it actually will let me change that. So this whole slide deck was created that way. It's kind of cool. Just because I'm so awesome at slides. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go talk about environment. So um, because we're on a screen, hopefully everybody can see that. If not, you can just pipe up in Slack and we'll, we'll take care of it. But so the first thing in the environment is hopefully there's not a whole lot of people that are sitting in a Windows 2008 R2 environment, but that does happen. I know there's several people or lots of people in the world that use still Windows 7. Um, by default, Windows PowerShell came on that uh, box or that OS, uh, but it was only version 2. So it's not as helpful, but that is the base version of PowerShell. Um, then it goes up from there where you see V3, V4, and V5. It was actually V5 and then 5.1 as we have anniversary updates and creators update and all the other updates. We get to these Windows 10 versions, but they've stopped at 5.1 something. And uh, the rest of the story is that there is um, a V6 uh, .x and there will one day be a V7 as they release, probably when they release uh, the core uh, 3.0. So the key here in environment is that you may be on uh, V3 right now because you're on Windows 2012. The key to remember is that you can actually up your version uh, by downloading and installing the WinRM version. So if you were to, uh, to search WinRM and the version, so you want to say you want to install four, you could say WinRM uh, four and then download and you would most likely get the first link would be the version of WinRM or Windows uh, Remote Management uh, tool that you can download and install on your OS. The key, the key to this is that 5.1 uh, requires you to have the .NET Framework uh, 4.7, I believe, and that won't run on Windows 7. At least it didn't when it was in the beginning. They might have made it possible to put that on Windows 7 now. Um, but that's really the limitation of what version you can go up to on the OS is the version of framework that your OS supports. So if your version of Windows doesn't support the version of framework that's required, which is on the WinRM web page, um, then you can't install that version on your OS. So the key is, is just not to be too antiquated. Windows XP, you can't even really do much on Windows XP. <laughs> it's kind of too old, I guess, so. Um, so once you get your environment set up that way, um, the key to remember here is that there are some key pieces to PowerShell 
um, for your environment to make it run better. We won't be talking about them today as far as when uh, PowerShell remoting, but PowerShell remoting by default in Windows 2012 and below is disabled for PS remoting. On Windows 2012 R2 and 8.1 and above, when you install Windows, it automatically has Windows PowerShell remoting already enabled for you. So you don't have to enable that. If, if you do not have that, and, and that is not the case, I forgot to put that in here, but you just uh, go into uh, a good PowerShell window in elevated mode and do en enable PS remoting. So the other thing that I forgot to put in this part, and that is the uh, execution policy. So the execution policy that you'll most likely run under is the remote signed execution policy. I won't go into what all of them are, but by default, the, the restricted uh, policy is what is set on the versions that are not um, 2012 R2 and above. So same goes for 2012 and below when PS remoting is not enabled the execution policy is always set as also set to restricted, which means you can't really run a command. You can run commands, but you cannot run any scripts, no matter what, signed or not signed, scripts are forbidden uh, under the re restricted uh, execution policy. So if you need to change that on the older versions, then you can set dash execution policy remote signed. And if you don't want to have the prompt, uh, then you can say dash force, and those Jedi's out there with the, their lightsabers uh, will be cheering because we can use the force in PowerShell. The 6.x um, is really about um, being able to be installed on Linux, um, but it also can be installed on Windows. It runs a little differently in that you would, it, it's not built into the OS. So it does put it in its own place and it is not in your default places. Um, the important part to remember is that both versions of PowerShell will run native commands and you can do things that you would normally do in PowerShell. But we're talking about today SQL PowerShell or PowerShell for the SQL DBA and that does change a few things. Um, they're getting way, way more uh, options for the 6.x or PowerShell core as they call it. Um, there's a lot more options for the DBA coming up as they convert or I guess, transform the SMO libraries into all .dot .NET Core. Um, they're all they're really close. Most of the commandlets will run uh, in SQL Server module on the the core, but there are some that do not. They've added they've actually added one that's uh, get SQL instance, um, which is nice to have that in uh, the core. So the other, other piece of the environments is just to know where things are. That confuses a lot of people. So we're going to just show you that there is a personal modules place and a global modules for PowerShell, um, which I mean for the engine, not for PowerShell in general. And then there's a global modules place for the user and the machine. Um, the first place is in your documents folder um, under your C users and then your username documents. There's a Windows PowerShell folder that by default does not exist um, when you install your OS or you create a new user and log in as that user. You'll have to create that, that, law, uh, that uh, directory and I'll show you how. But the modules live in there um, and that, that's important to know when you install something scoped to your user. You need to know where that is if you ever want to go and remove that or delete it or, or even X copy deploy. Um, these modules, which is which is a really cool feature with the PowerShell gallery. The global modules for PowerShell, there's an intrinsic variable, which we'll talk about in a second, that the PowerShell home, there's a modules folder under that where all the PowerShell things that are installed with PowerShell come and they're installed there. But for your purpose, for the DBA's purpose, the most common place, or I would say the, the right place, I use right in a very weird way, but the right place for modules for your user and machine is really in the C program files, Windows PowerShell modules uh, place. It used to be somewhere else, uh, but now they've put it in a global place, not in the, the global modules for PowerShell uh, place. It's actually in program files, Windows PowerShell, and that folder does get created for you. And then a modules folder underneath there. Uh, the key to remember about modules 
um, which we'll talk about a little later when we install and update them, is that the modules folder will contain the folder underneath there with the name of the module and underneath that folder there will be versions. And I'll show you uh, the DBA tools module since it uh, revs quite often, uh, a lot more than some. Uh, that's because they haven't gone to 1.0, but the, the revisions get stored in a folder just in case you want to load a certain version of the module. So it's kind of handy there. Um, so let's talk about the uh, environment here so that you get a hang of what, what's going on. And that is the, the there's some intrinsic variables that you'll uh, become familiar with. If you write scripts that are going to be run across different machines and you don't really have control of your uh, machine setup um, because you're a DBA, you'll want to take advantage of this variable to have it tell you uh, what versions you have on this machine. So in the PS version table, you'll see that the PS version is 5.1 and that the, the addition is desktop. So if you were on a server, it would not say desktop. If you're on core, it will say core. So you'll get a good idea by just interrogating this variable, PS version table dot PS addition. And you can do that inside your script to get the desktop or to get whatever so that you can tell whether you're running on a server or a desktop. So that's kind of handy when you have that. Uh, that intrinsic variable will always have that for you. Um, host is also another interesting intrinsic variable will, that will tell you who's hosting PowerShell. Um, this one is console host. If I were to fire up uh, ISE and I did the ISC here and I said host, you would see that it says it's the Windows PowerShell ISC host. So you could get an idea of where your script is running and uh, what host you're running under. The, the same goes for if you run in the uh, extension on VS Code or Azure Data Studio, there's an extension that runs PowerShell and it would tell you that you're running under the VS Code host or the uh, Azure Data Studio host. So that's one way to tell where you're running. So if you don't want to run on a uh, on anything but console host, then you can edit that out with host dot uh, with the host variable. So let's talk about a couple other basics uh, for intrinsic variables that will help you. Well, may help you in your programming, maybe not. But uh, the one is profile. This is uh, those for those of you who have age behind you. Um, I grew up in the days of the black box and there really wasn't windows. It was just the box. It booted up into DOS and you had this prompt and that's all you had. And if you connected to a network via NetWare or uh, later in windows, uh, you had a login script to map your drives and map your printers because there was no such thing as um, persistent drives back then. And so in your login script, you would have a, a scenario where you'd uh, do your mappings. And if that login script ran, uh, then you would, your environment would be set up. So we have a profile in PowerShell that will act like a login script. It is only ran once when you fire up the console or you fire up the PowerShell.exe and it will load this profile and then it will drop you into your prompt. We're gonna do a little trickery with the prompt. I'll show you the prompt that I use. Um, you, you're welcome to it. I will make sure you get the downloads that I'm going to show you the prompt here in a second, but it's in my profile because it loads once and the prompt function controls my uh, prompt when I get out of my uh, command. The other variable is PS home. This is where the PowerShell home lives and we'll show you each one of these values so that you can see where they are. Uh, but the PowerShell home is where PowerShell lives. The home without PS is where your documents folder lives. Now it's interesting, but this home directory does not map directly to documents. It actually just maps to C users and then your username and that's it. You'd have to add documents and Windows PowerShell on the end of it, but at least it tells you where a starting point is to your data. And the last, uh, er, uh, the last intrinsic variable we'll talk about today is the error action preference. So those of you familiar with PowerShell, whenever you run a command, if it errors out, uh, there is an error action preference in PowerShell that, that lets your error happen the way you want it to. Or at least by default, if you never change it, it's what PowerShell thinks you want. 
So the error action preference by default is continue, which means that the command may error, or if you have a script with seven commands, your script may error on one command, but it will not stop the script. It will continue on and go to the next command and the next command till all commands are ran. And whatever succeeded, succeeded. Whatever didn't gave you some red or whatever color on the screen, and you'd have to deal with those things. You can set this thing to silently continue. So instead of continue with errors on the screen, you can do silently continue, and it will just not error, but it will continue. It will error, but it won't show you the error message on the screen, but it will continue. Um, the other one that's common is stop. So stop just says, hey, when you find, when you go to and get your first error, please stop the script. Just don't even go any further uh, and you can decide to do that. The cool piece of this is that most of the commands in uh, PowerShell, even in modules, have a parameter uh, if, if you allow that. There's a way to allow that. Um, but if you allow that in your function, then you can actually say dash error action and say silently continue or stop or something for that one script or that one command instead of um, letting it continue. Or you can go and change this variable, just say error, dollar sign error action equals silently continue or stop and it will stop it. So you get to control your environment somewhat uh, where you want to do those things, um, but you don't have to set these. You can use them strictly for information or whatever you want, but these are built into to PowerShell when you execute PowerShell.exe or start your console, whichever, if you click, I guess that's, that, that's how it works too. Um, these come to you by default, so it's kind of handy. The other thing to know about the environment is there's some very nice things to, to interact with the OS uh, that will help you. Um, one of them is ENV, and this is an interesting one because there's a drive for environment but there's also a variable that's intrinsic that you can do dollar sign env and then colon and the variable in that environment variable. And I don't think a lot of people play with these variables, but basically they're in your, uh, if you were to go into your uh, PC and do properties here and click advanced system settings, here's your environment variables right here. I don't know that a lot of people play with these or do anything with them, but it, it back in the day, it was huge in the, in the DOS environment where you'd set your environment variables to keep track of things. Cause so some of the examples are um, your path variable. Uh, the other one that comes in that you don't see here cause you don't set it is the, um, we'll just go back into the code here and look at our console. If you did a directory of environment, Let's see, directory of ENV. You would see some things here that actually um, aren't in the system environment variables, at, AKA this computer name is set by Windows, but you don't get to set it in your environment variable. So there are some things that are just intrinsic in your environment variables, but it's nice. They have the AMD64 for your processor architecture. They have all sorts of things, processor levels. And here's your temp variable where, you, where the temp files get put. Um, you could change that if you want. Most of the system environment variables, you have to log off and log back on to get them to set because they're the system environment variables. Here's the user environment ones that also require you to, oh, actually the system ones require you to reboot. But the, the, the user variables you can actually set and they'll actually come up in this list of an ENV colon as well. But you get to set your own environment variables that require you to log off and log back on but you can set any number of those or add new ones if you wish to, to, to set up your environment. So that's kind of a handy little thing. Uh, most people don't really think about it because uh, they either come from new school or they just have never been introduced to the system environment type things. Uh, there's another drive that's intrinsic to PowerShell that you just get for free as well, and that is the variable drive. So if you've ever um, created a variable, if we say, uh, variable one equals Ben and do a directory of variable. I will see variable one right here and it's equal to Ben. So it's kind of handy to, to have a place where you can 
uh, have your variables stuck and know if that variable's been defined or what is in that variable, stuff like that. So it's a drive that's, that's there. Um, we won't go too much into drives because of time, but it's a fun little thing to see what you have available in your environment. And the, these can actually help you uh, because it is a drive. So you can actually reference them in uh, removing variables, which is kind of slick. So let's take a look at the profile here for a second. So the dollar sign profile contains a path, and this is my path on mine. So C users Ben, then my documents, Windows PowerShell, and the profile actually contains the file name as well. And this is the file name we have here. I'll show it to you on the console profile. Um, you'll see that it has C users Ben OneDrive documents, Windows PowerShell, and then there's my file that, that is used. Now I will give you a little hint that in other environments or other consoles or hosts, they have maybe different ones. So see this one says PowerShell underscore profile. If I were to look at profile in this guy, you'll see that it includes ISE in the little guy and that's just because it's the ISE. Now not everybody, not every host requires you to have a special uh, name of file but the two that do for sure and all the other clients that you may use uh, may not depending on how they use powershell.exe but this one says ISE the VS code one has VS code in the list so it just depends on where you are and you'll want to be aware of that because if you write a PowerShell profile like this with this name and you fire up the ISE it will not load um, the ISE profile wouldn't exist by default and you would need to create that special to use the ISE. So just be aware that that can come back and, and scare you or make you think, hey, something didn't run, my thing's broken, my environment's not set up right. It's just naming, that's what it is. All right, so let's go quickly through a profile and tell you why you, you need a profile or why you should have a profile, especially as a DBA where this isn't normal. If you were to log in into Windows and you open up Management Studio and you connect to a SQL server. There's no login script that sets up your SQL server environment, but there are a lot of options in SSMS that you can set your fonts, your size of font, your um, different things that you want, the, the views of the windows and how, what you want your font to be there. So there's all sorts of things you can create inside Management Studio like line numbers and things that you can configure your environment. The difference is there's really no script that you go and run as part of starting up Management Studio because the application itself is, is the way it's written is it does it with options and those options are loaded. In PowerShell, you actually get the option to do any of these things. So the first thing I do is create me a string that has the get date or the, the date in hour and year, month, day, and then 24 hour minutes and seconds just for use in transcripts and all sorts of things that I might use uh, in my profile I just want the date in that format so I can append it to a path and get a unique name of a file. The next thing I do is I always start a transcript. Um, those of you who've been in, uh, watched court shows or been to court and seen somebody up there with a little type, type thing and the thing just rolls the, <clears throat> the paper out into the back. Um, this is for purposes of being able to record everything that happened and who said it so they can either read it back or that can go in the transcript of the court. Um, that way they know exactly what happened and who did what. In our world, um, this could be seen as not really uh, that cool. Uh, but as a DBA, there's many times I have written a script and ran something and ran something in the same window. And I overwrote the things in the window because it, it produced a new grid and I wanted the old grid back. And so I either have to copy it out into Excel or do something else. And I didn't get to see what came out on the screen. And if you enable statistics IO in, in SQL, um, that goes away too with every command. It just produces a new one and you don't get any historical uh, versions of those. So the transcript is meant to whatever you see on the screen uh, like this, we've seen all of this, this would go into my transcript. So I could actually have that later uh, to review. And that would help me to uh, know which commands executed well, uh, which commands didn't, or how do I even create this thing? I knew I figured it out, but it was yesterday, and I can't even remember last night's dinner, let alone what I did during work yesterday. So that's helpful to be able to go back in time into this text file and say what happened. And I append my date here, so it lets me 
I have transcript underscore in the date. So I have several profile or several transcripts in my, uh, my path. Um, register engine event. That's a cool little thing. If you've ever, uh, if you've ever learned what windows does a lot, um, it used to not do this as much, but in the later versions of windows, it seems it's buffering more. So all of your stuff that you see in the console window here, uh, goes into a buffer first for speed. And then that buffer gets flushed out to disk. And we know about that because we have buffer pool in SQL Server. Same principle, um, except we don't have a log back system <laughs> on PowerShell. Sorry, there's no transaction log that gets, trans, uh, that gets uh, force written to so we make sure we can recover. Uh, there's really no recovery scenario here. So in the case that you have put this stuff in a, pro, in a transcript, you'll want a way to make sure that it gets flushed. And the way to flush it is this guy right here. So if you don't type in stop transcript or have stop transcript execute, then you could end up losing part of your buffered uh, transcript and that could be a, a sad day. Um, I haven't had it corrupt only once by not typing in stop transcript, but I have lost data because I didn't do that. So I register an engine event, which is a PowerShell command that says when PowerShell is exiting, when I type in exit, the action is stop my transcript and then I'm good. And uh, so that, that gets done in my profile as well. So if I type in exit and I forget to type, type in stop transcript, I'm done. The next thing I do is history. We'll, we'll show you history in a second, but history is, is a way every command you run, uh, PowerShell keeps track of. And its job in history is to show the command you ran, when it started, when it ended, and the success or failure, which they call the completed status, um, uh, or the execution status, I mean, and that that part is kept in this history. Now, you might think, well, once I exit the window, the history is gone, and that's true, but why would I care? So imagine having a transcript that shows you all the commands, but you now have to go find them and type them in because you have to copy and paste from your transcript. Sometimes that can be a pain in the butt. So instead, be, uh, once I show you my prompt, you'll understand why this is, is cool. But I basically get my history. Um, uh, in, my, in my beginning, I add history. In my exit, I'll, I'll get history, so I'll show you that. So I've already, I guess I should put this ahead. Exit me is my function that I, I can type in to stop my transcript, to get my history, where the execution status is completed, because I really don't care um, whether it completed or not. This will mess me up in my, in my other thing, but I do this for illustration purposes that you can filter. If I didn't filter, I'd get a one-to-one, -one, whatever ran, and, and just put it out into history file. I export it into a client XML file with a path of this, and I exit my window. To add it back, my profile starts and says, get me all the import CLI XML file from this history file, and then pipe it to add history, which adds all my history back into my history. So in my window, I can type in get dash history and all of it comes back. So instead of having a SQL script that I've kept and I've saved and I've executed one at a time or putting in a stored procedure, this is a way to keep track of what I executed and when I executed it and what the success or failure was in that execution. So it's kind of handy. Um, this is another one I've put in here. I've, I've found myself wanting to know what assemblies are loaded into my console. Um, so I, I created this function just so I could call a function instead of having to type in this big thing all the time just to get what I want. So this function gets loaded in my profile so it's always available to me ever after. And this little guy is a little fun one uh, that I, I think is pretty cool. Um, for those PowerShellers out there that, that uh, don't really know about this, it's kind of a cool little feature, but there is an ASCII 4 in the ASCII chart that corresponds to a, a control D. And that control D is, is uh, two keystrokes, and then I hit enter, and that's three keystrokes. It's one less keystroke than exit, and two less keystrokes than exit enter. So I've saved myself two keystrokes every time I want to exit my, my console. So that's kind of cool. But I do an invoke expression and set my function name to be control D and it executes the exit me guy, which we know is right up here. So that keystrokes will stop my count. What's that? Keystrokes count. That's important. Yeah, keystrokes count for sure. Especially when you're on the, on, on the typing realm. It's always good <laughs> to save keystrokes. So this is, 
This is the end of my profile other than to set my prompt. So this prompt function is a global function that PowerShell reads every time it wants to show you your prompt. So what I do, I mean, there, I'm not going to go through this. You can read it if you want to go into some advanced stuff. It's kind of fun. But um, it basically sets up a, prof, uh, a, a prompt like this. So if you look at this, it has the date and time of when that prompt was shown. Then it has the execution time that it, the last command executed. So then this prompt, it does go and calculate the start and end time and tell me how many seconds it took to run that last command. So even if I ran a command and it was gonna run 10 minutes, I walked away, went to lunch, came back, I would know because this would tell me that it ran for 10 minutes instead of the hour that I come back and I see this date and time. So it's kind of handy to have this little counter in there. And then I also put the, the um, path of where I am at. So this is quite a ways into my path. But the reason is because if I do this with no prompt, and I guess it might be a little hard to show that. I wish there was a way. Um, I, I could do that if I, let's see, run PowerShell. No profile. This is the ugly prompt you get without a profile. And if, if I had that big long path, my C prompt would be way over here where I could start a command and that's too far over there. So I, I like to put my path above in the top up here so I don't have to worry about it being on there. And then my, my command prompt starts right after this number. And this number is the number of items I have in my history. So in my transcript, I will see this in my transcript of 314. If I didn't do the where execution status equals completed, I could map this one to one to my, my history that I import every time I go in. So if I looked in my transcript and it said 314, I could go back to my history that I could find here, get history. I could go all the way back and get 314. If I wanted... 302, I could say get history ID of 302 and I would get back my one command and I could pull that out and execute it again. So it's pretty slick to have that in my profile. Um, but then I start my little, uh, my, my command prompt and now I can start typing what I want in my, in my thing here and that's, that's what I do. So that's pretty slick. All right, so that's profile. Hopefully that was understandable. Now we're going to switch to um, th these. I put these in here so that you can run them yourself. So if I did F F8 there, I, I, I could see that that's what it contains. Um, PS Home would show me the Windows System 32 Windows PowerShell V10 folder. That's where the PowerShell.exe lives. And again, Home here shows me my user's bin. My error action preference um, is continue. So you have that option as well. And then you can reference the environment, which is really special this way. And I could say what's in this, this thing and it will tell me all of that stuff. So it's kind of slick to be able to use these guys, but these ENV variable alias and function are drives that keep track of all the aliases and the functions that you have on your system. So it is kind of slick to be able to know those kind of things. So let's go back in, let's go into basics now. So for the DBA, we have the idea of um, variables. Now in the next section, I'll show you some syntax differences uh, just to give you an idea because again, DBAs have told me over the years that they'll never learn PowerShell because it's too hard or there really isn't a reason and, and most of it stems from not understanding some simple basics just to be able to read scripts and find out what they do and then, and then you get addicted. It's like your IT drug. It's really kind of cool. Uh, but the idea is this. Variables in PowerShell all start with dollar sign. Dollar sign is a reserve character for several reasons. And it is a dynamic language, which means that you don't ever declare them. When they, when they have a value assigned to them, they are instantiated. That, that's what happens. You're, you're now in the mix and you have a variable. And it assigns the variable. Every variable has to have a type, just like we know about in SQL. We declare a variable, but we have to give it a type. Same thing in C-sharp and VB and all those other things. And um, in PowerShell, it's no different. So what PowerShell does when you assign it a value, 
it actually will then assign it a data type based on what it infers from what you put on the command line. So no quotes means it's something other than a string. Now, if I put string on the, on the command line without quotes, it would then infer that it's a string because it certainly isn't numeric. But for purposes of your code, you should not be in the habit of putting uh, in code in your scripts things without quotes, just so that the person reading it can see that it is actually a string and you didn't mean it to be a variable. You just forgot to put the dollar sign. So if I do one, it becomes an int32. If I put a string with quotes, and this, these are magic quotes, or you can do a, a single quoted string like this, and they are the same, they are the same semantically, but we'll show you where that changes when we use magic quotes, but they become strings. And if I, oh, if I did var1 again, it would then overwrite the int to be a string because that's the type it is now. So it would throw away the other variable and create a new one with the string uh, type. So the, the big thing here is I want, you to, I want you to see that I could put a number in the quotes. And the one major piece that you need to understand about PowerShell is it has this principle called the first, win, the first in wins. And that's what I named it. I think that, I don't think that that's actually an official title of it, but that's what I call it. The first one in wins. So the first argument of every uh, plus or everything you do to add something is always governed by the first one in the list. So if I have var one and, and var two and var three, and I execute these to assign them variables, nothing happens except assignment. So nothing came back. And I execute this guy, var1 plus var2. What would you expect to happen? Well, based on the rules, var1 is an int. So I would expect that the int wants to coerce everything after it to be an int. And sure enough, it tries to. So it says cannot convert value string to type system int32. And that's because I said I wanted to plus var1 plus var2, one's an int, and one is a string. So it would try to coerce the word string to equal a, a, a number to plus them, and it fails because it's, a, it's an alphanumeric, so that's not helpful. If I did var2 plus var1, what do you think it becomes? String one, because the first one was a string, and it coerced the int to be a string and added them together, and so it concatenated them. If I did var1 plus var3, I would expect to see three because var3 has two in quotes, which is a string, but it is convertible. Now again, do you really want to do this? I mean, it's no different than in, in SQL where we have C convert implicits. We all know they're evil and they can cause bad things to happen. So whenever you're coding inside PowerShell, just I'll show you a way not to use plus and it will become much better. But at the same time, if I do var3 plus var1, I end up with 21 because 2 was a string and it coerced the 1. Even though it was an int, it coerced it to be a string, so I just concatenated 2 plus 1. Okay? So got the hang of that. It's pretty cool, but it's something, to, it's something important to remember. When we talk about assemblies, we'll talk about the same thing. So here's some syntax just for your purposes, so I'm not going to go through every one of them, but declare... I don't declare anymore. I just assign my variable with a dollar instead of an at equal to a, ver a value and I'm done. Um, exec. So you're going to exec a command. You're going to put at with filter equals and then at with filter type. And if I were to do it in PowerShell, I would invoke my command, just run it with dash filter and then no equals my value and no comma. So no comma when there's multiple if you put a comma here, it becomes an array and it will send that array down to your first argument and that's not what you want. So you do spaces between your arguments and then you can put your values after your arguments with no equal sign. So we don't do equals and we don't do commas on the command line. So that's something to remember differently in a DBA world. And the last thing I'll show you is this where we have if then and else and stuff. If exists, we do a begin. We do something, and then we end the begin, and then we else space if exists, and then we begin, we do something, and then the last one is an else, 
and we begin and end, and we're good for SQL. In PowerShell, it's the begin and end become curly braces. So you just got to get used to less typing, right? See, there's three here and five here. I've just got one little guy here. So that's kind of nice, saved some keystrokes. And I also have parentheses after the if, and that's required. You have to have, you cannot do it without the parentheses. So the parentheses are just meant to tell PowerShell, this is one entity. I want you to do what you need to do. And then this else if doesn't have a space like, like SQL does. Else if here has a space and else if here does not. But it still requires the parentheses and you can actually, it's allowed to have a space there. I just don't because I don't. And then notice I don't do a print or anything like that. It's just, I don't do a select or it's just a curly brace and then two and it goes back out. And then an else is just an else with the curly braces. All right, so those two syntaxes are the most common ones you're gonna deal with in variables and executing things or in an if for an if structure to make decisions. Outside of that, it's just learning how to execute functions, finding the functions you're gonna execute and doing what you do uh, in, in a logical format. The other thing I will tell you is PowerShell is a top-down. You can think of it like SQL because if you execute a stored procedure, it starts at the top and ends at the bottom. And so everything in between is executed and parsed. If you try to do something before a table is created, so say you create a temp table inside a stored procedure and you do it after you try to use it, it doesn't parse the whole entire thing and say, hey, I'm good. I, I know that you created after, so I'm just going to use it. It has to be done before the statement and PowerShell is the exact same way. You have to declare it first and then you can use it later. So it's a very much a top down. It's an interpreted language, kind of like T-SQL. And so they go top, top down. These little curly braces are how you do code blocks. So this is a code block. This is a code block. So just know that whenever you see these curly braces, uh, you're within some kind of block. I'll show you where that doesn't apply to hash tables, but for the most part, that's what you, when you see these guys, you'll know that's what it is. So the last thing we'll talk about is help and objects um, just to get you started. And then we're going to use PowerShell. So we have, how long do we have? 15 more minutes? Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, 15 um, minutes. Awesome. So the get help, um, help after version three is not downloaded on install. So if you install version four on your older version of PowerShell, help does not come down uh, as part of the payload. You must update the help yourself, which is these guys. We'll talk about that in a minute. The one little fun thing here, um, don't you wish that all stored procedures had help? Like you could go, how do you use this stupid thing? Um, and it had that all, all in there. Um, SP who is active is a great example where they built help into it. So you could do SP who is active and then at help equals one. And it will give you a nice blob of stuff coming out and telling you how to use it, what your parameters are and what your values that you could put in those parameters are. So it's kind of handy. Um, in PowerShell, uh, I deal with modules that are done in the, the PowerShell gallery, which help is a requirement. Now, it doesn't say that it validates that help actually is useful, but you would hope the people creating your help would actually make it useful. So this little tip here, get help show window, um, we're going we're gonna to use that in a second, and you'll see why that matters. If you don't use show window, um, there's options called full and detailed and examples or nothing. Uh, you can do it with nothing and it will give you a, a simple one. Uh, but full gives you everything. A detailed minus is, I think, the syntax and the examples will only give you the examples. It omits your parameters and things like that in your thing, in your, in your function. Uh, the beauty is that help will derive some of the things inside your uh, function, like your parameters. It will detail your parameters without you having to detail them. Um, but the reason why it's important is because there's a lot of built-in help such as uh, about help about comparison operators to teach you how to compare things. But the biggest concern in your environment is a lot of people have servers that are behind firewalls or behind, they don't have access to the internet. So that can be a problem. And so what you can do is on a machine that does have access to the internet, you can save help to a destination path and specify a folder that exists and it will dump the help contents into that folder. And then you can go to the machine that can reach the machine you just pulled it down on 
you can update help with the source path of that. And obviously it would probably be a UNC, but for example, on this machine that's contrived, but it would pull the help files from this folder and update your help on that machine. So you don't have to worry about going somewhere else to look at your help and then going back to execute. So that's kind of handy. The other two commands that you'll see uh, quite a bit, I would say still add type is going away a little bit. Um, you're starting to get to see more add types that are more complex, whether they're compiling C sharp or VB. Um, but for the most part, you're adding an assembly. We're going to talk about an SMO really quick uh, in a minute, but add type your assembly name. And that's a strong name. You're actually going to put the strong name in uh, of your assembly. And the beauty is that SMO has this public key token that is the same for all versions of PowerShell uh, or for SMO. So it's kind of handy, but you'll add types to get access to functions or objects inside those uh, inside these DLLs. And that's what we'll show you in a second. And then to get the objects created from these guys that load the classes is that you're going to add a new object to your uh, the script and type name is going to be the full class name with the argument list. This actually creates me a new SMO server object and makes a connection to SQL Server. I'll show you other ways to do that, but I'm going to show you this show window really quick, just so you get an idea of what it does. Um, it's going to have to find the about comparison operators and that will be, that will be in a minute. Come on. I should have chosen another one that's more common, but I haven't done get help for a while on this machine. So it has to index all this stuff. Um, we'll go back while it's doing that. And the other command that's kind of handy is the get service. Uh, those of you who haven't used it, that if you're regularly on the command line and you want to know what instances there are on the SQL server, this is a way to do that. Everything starts with MSSQL for SQL and you can do star and, and find out those things like that. So it's kind of nice. Um, yeah, that's probably why there's a typo. Nice. That's probably why I didn't find it. It was very nice. Good I was just going to say that. <laughs> Slack channel. Good job. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll execute it again because because you should never type in your demo code. <laughs> Just kidding. If I ex the other problem here is that sometimes you end up with window that hides behind itself. So I have to minimize everything and then hopefully it shows up right. Uh, it didn't. So, um, oh, well, I will do it out here. Oh, there it is. So it was in a different one. So it shows me the topic and things like that. The cool thing about show window is I can type in uh, PowerShell, um, and it will actually highlight all of the instances and then tell me there's 30 matches on the screen. I can go next, 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 which is kind of cool. Um, the other thing you can do is go into your settings and say, I don't want to see inputs. I don't want to see remarks. I don't, I can see, I can pull out sections I don't want just to focus on ones I do. So that's kind of slick there, but show window is a way to see all of the help. It doesn't require you to do full or detailed. It's just the whole thing. You get it. Um, and that's kind of handy for the help side of things. If I were to execute this, you would see that I had four instances on my machine, the default instance, which is MS SQL Server, then a SQL Express, TD and TD Restore for other demos I do. And so that's kind of handy to get a quick view of what server um, or what SQL servers there are. This one does have a computer name um, parameter for get service. So you can actually, not sure why it's not coming up, but you can actually do a computer name and actually go across another machine and get them, which is kind of slick. All right, so we're tracking here. So the, the one thing I wanted to show, uh, there's two parts of things that make it simpler and you really can't do this in T-SQL. So I'm not gonna reference any ways to do this in T-SQL, but for a DBA going, why should I care? Um, there's a lot of things that in T-SQL we do and we put them in temp tables. So we have this bag that we can carry around and I equate that to like an array. If I have an object or even a select statement of values and I want to plus them together and keep them in one bag so that I can use it at the end. Say I'm going across five servers, I'm pulling back all the database names and I just want a consolidated list of all of them. Um, to do that in T-SQL, you would either use link servers um, and you could uh, put them in a temp table and push them, push them in there and select from each one of them. You could use central management server and do a query across uh, the things and get them back. Or in PowerShell, you can do an array. And so the array is what I wanted to tell you really quick here. In, a, in PowerShell, there's a few objects that are immutable. And that means they cannot be changed once you create them. An array is one of those such objects. When you create an array, 
Um, this is a, a syntax for at and then parentheses parentheses is a blank array. This is an array that's defined and this is an array that's defined without special at syntax, which is kind of cool. And the idea is that once you have an array, so if I create this array, it's not, it's not very hard to create it. If I wanted to add something to this array, this is the syntax. Array plus equals and then an object that you're going to put in the array. The problem with that is that they're immutable. So the array gets thrown away and recreated. So if I did 10,000 of them, like here, 10,000, I'll show you what this syntax is in a minute. I guess I should have put that above it, but I always talk about it afterwards. Um, this is doing one to 10,000 in ones. So think of it like an identity column kind of on the fly in PowerShell. So I'm going to measure the command of doing one to 10,000, doing a for each object, and I'm just gonna add 10,000 things to this array one at a time. And then we're gonna measure the command where we're gonna use an array list. So this is the new, uh, it's a, a .NET object, but I still use the same syntax to create it. But this isn't immutable, it actually is a memory array. So it's a memory object that holds your uh, memory. And if you add an, an option or an object to it, it just adds it and it, it just expands memory. So we're gonna create our array here and then we're going to do our little test. So this will measure how long it takes to do a 10,000 array um, it's taken a little bit. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. So it took five seconds and 51 milliseconds. So five seconds to do that. Doesn't seem like too terrible, right? For 10,000 objects. We're going to do it with an array list instead of an array and see how fast it is. Oh, okay. It didn't even make it to a second or a half a second. It was just 208 milliseconds. So super fast uh, compared to throwing away a 9,999 object array and making a 10,000 one. That's just a lot of memory and a lot of garbage collection. So just be aware there's some speed differences in different objects that you can use in PowerShell. So this is there's just an illustration of what one dot dot does. Now, usually you'll see it without spaces, but this IDE actually puts spaces in there for, I don't know why. But on the command line, you just do one dot dot 10. You don't have to put the spaces in. But basically all it does is print one through 10. That's what it does. I can do a for each and do the same thing and do one through 10, that's kind of cute. Or I can do a four each and I can add them together and then get two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. So that's kind of cute too. But the point is, is that you can use these in your DBA world. Say you needed to expand um, a log file 10 times. You could actually uh, one dot dot 10 and then pipe it to for each and execute the, in, uh, the expand log file. So you don't have to do it um, in one big chunk. You don't have to do it uh, manually. You can just have it do it with the pipeline. Um, if we had time, we'd go into some really fun pipeline stuff, but that uh, would have to be a different session. And the last thing I want to teach you before we go in to do something, because we have, yep, we have five more minutes after this, so we'll be just in time. So the idea is that splatting is a principle in PowerShell that makes it pretty powerful because you have objects that you sometimes create using other things and we're going to use a hash table to do it. This is my function that basically takes a parameter of first name, last name, favorite pet, and then I just write them out. Now remember I talked about the magic quotes. These double quotes act as qu uh, quotes that allow replacements inside strings. And for the basics, this variable would be replaced. It sees the dollar sign and it says, I'm going to get the variable name after the dollar sign and a space cannot be in a, a variable name, so it stops after first name. It takes the dollar sign first name and says, whatever's in first name, put it in this string. Does the same thing for last name, and then does the same thing for favorite pet. And then once whatever is in there gets replaced, it puts it into one string instead of plussing them together, right? So it doesn't throw away the first string, throw away the second string, so it doesn't do that. So that's my function, so we'll execute that just to put it in a memory. Because again, it executes from top to bottom. If I don't define it, it won't automatically put it in there. I'm going to create a hash table. So you saw the array with the parentheses. I'm going to use curly braces in this hash table and on each separate line. It doesn't require a semicolon or a comma if you do that. So I put first name without a dollar equals my name, last name equals my name, and that's my variable called splat. If I typed in splat, you just see name is first name, last name, 
And then values are the values for these name and values. So hash tables, just a name and value pair. Now I'm going to put in a splat two that has my favorite pet in it. So I'm just going to go like this and execute that. And now I have two hash tables. Splatting is where I call my function. And instead of a dash, so I could say dash favorite pet, okay? Or dash first name, last name. I put an at symbol in front of the variable instead of a dollar sign. And it will pass that object in and match first name, last name to my parameters of first name, last name. Now, if I wanted to, I could do this and it will then not, it won't show me favorite pet. See, Ben Miller and favorite pet was just blank. So it replaced blank. If I want to splat twice, I can splat twice as long as the variable name inside the splat is not duplicated. So if I splat, I can see Ben Miller Lily and that's two splats. Or I can say splat with one variable and then add my parameter of favorite pet and overload it that way and I get the same result, okay? So splatting becomes a pretty cool thing in that you can use several different ways to splat into uh, functions. And this is a really cool way if you had server lists or if you had uh, favorite databases or stuff and you put them as variables in your profile, you could just use them instead of having to define them because you defined them in your profile, but it's pretty slick. Really neat. Awesome, awesome. Um, so let's talk about tools here. So we have a few minutes here. So the, the, the module I'm going to be focused on today is DBA tools. There's a SQL server module and Aaron will be disappointed because I won't, I don't have time to do uh, both in this one. But um, the reason is just because there's some functions in here that will show some quick and dirty things that, that DBAs might do quickly or want to do quickly. And so I'm just going to use the module DBA tools. So I'll import the module. If I don't have the module on the machine, <clears throat> I can install module DBA tools and it will look out on the PowerShell gallery. And again, this has to be done on a machine that has internet access. If you don't have internet access on your machine, you can actually install module on a machine that does and go to that modules folder I told, told you about where it is the, um, if you go into the, this PC and you go into C windows or C program files and windows PowerShell, you will see, that there is a modules folder and DBA tools is right here. And inside DBA tools, you have all these versions. So I've downloaded the latest one, at least as of 4.4 and it's 801 and it's going to update that module. Now I could take this folder of DBA tools and I could copy it and put it somewhere else on another machine, anywhere. And those modules are self-contained. They don't have any dependencies outside that folder. So X copy, copy deployment anywhere you want. That's kind of cool. Same with SQL Server module. You can do the same. If you want to update module TBA tools because it changes a lot, you can do update module and it will get the, the latest one from DBA or from PowerShell Gallery and, and put it in there. So I think it should be loaded now. If I do server equals connect dash DBA instance and tell it what instance I want, and I can even set my application name. So in Management Studio, the program name says Bob O Bob. So if I execute that, it connects to my SQL Server instance and I can get all my databases out of that instance with SMO. So all of a sudden I have all of those. So it's pretty slick. You can do lots of things there. Say I wanted to find a database in my instance of databases, I can put a variable called name demo DB or I don't have to, I can just put it here. But I can do server.databases.name and get all the names of my databases only and ask the PowerShell to find out if it contains this guy. So if I execute this guy, it will come back and say that there's true because there is in fact a demo DB on my server. Um, and there's, here's some functions that exist in DBA tools, get DBA backup history. So if you've ever wanted to quickly get uh, this and you don't have the query handy, um, you can get the backup history by specifying the SQL instance and the database you want back. And it will give me a list of my backups that I've taken, um, the, the start and the end and the device type I put it to, the file size or total size of it, the type of backup, whether it's a log or full, and my database names and my instances. So that's a quick and dirty way to get it. You can, they, it does have filtering options where you can do since, you can do last LSN, you can do all raw, you can do all sorts of things and you can even include copy only if they have copy only backups. So there's lots of parameters for this that you can just quickly get it. Um, the other thing you can do is get DBA agent job history. Um, and it will give you the job history of 
that job and you can see how it has the status of succeeded or the status of canceled down here at the bottom. Um, so I can see different things without writing a query. I can actually get that from these commands. And it also has filter options where you can say start date, end date, exclude job. If you want to do all the jobs, you don't put the job uh, parameter in and it will do all jobs. So all sorts of fun little things with two commands. As a DBA, somebody already wrote the proc. You don't have to write the proc. You don't have to ever write SP who is active. It's already there for you. You just get to leverage it. That's the principle here is that you get to leverage these commands that have been written. There's over uh, 400 or 500 commands inside DBA tools and over 100 in SQL Server module. So it's pretty, pretty slick. Now contrast that with the coder that wants to code and do this kind of thing where you create your new objects of your server and then you wanna program them and all sorts of stuff. You can do lots of things, but or you can just run a command, remove databases. If I wanna drop my database, I remove database and, I'm, and it just does it. So pretty slick, um, you can do either one. But as a DBA, you, you shouldn't necessarily ignore the idea of having a, another tool uh, in your toolbox um, because that just causes you more work. And yes, it's some typing or you've built scripts that do multiple things and use multiple commands, but now it's in a script that's kind of documentation for you how you did it. And it also lets you go edit it later and have the script do one more thing or two more things or do something else in between. And that to me is powerful in, in making my, myself go longer. If I have to click my way through everything and I have 10 servers, 20 servers, 100 servers, I am not going to click through every bloody database and do those things to it with clicking. It will, I'll never scale, I'll never get done. And with PowerShell, I actually can get done. So that's all I had. Um, hopefully that was helpful. It give you a nice little flavor of where you can go. Um, believe me, this was only a scratch of the surface, but at least it gives you an idea and it's super fun to dive in and learn some new stuff.